Um, uh, morning, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Ib Salimo, uh, one of the registrars here at the University of Cape Town. Uh, welcome to our weekly uh, uh, Zoom meetings. Um, just uh, housekeeping issues, just to ensure that um, all your, your microphones are on mute. And uh, if you have any comments or questions, just reserve them for the end of the presentation, or you can just type in the chat function. Um, so to start off my presentation, I'm just gonna uh, present to you uh, a case that we are currently managing here at our teaching hospital at Grotesque in Cape Town. Um, I have no disclosures. Um, so the case presentation is of a 36 year old uh, gentleman uh, who presented with a uh, horsey horse voice over four months, um, which was progressive and getting uh, worse and progressive. He had no recent uh, history of upper respiratory tract infections. And um, he's a known smoker uh, with a 10 pack year history and also a heavy alcohol drinker. Uh, he works as a general worker in construction. <coughs> and of not he is HIV and he has no uh, comorbidities. Um, he had no uh, odynophagia, no dysphagia. He had no issues with his breathing. Yeah. On cough and uh, no uh, uh, known history of uh, uh, TB contact, and he also not. Uh, um, he had no no uh, 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 any weight loss reported. Mm -hmm. Uh, so in the past medical history and such about history and no history of any chronic illnesses and uh, no history of previous surgery, no known allergies, and was not on any medication. Um, on examination, he was a well looking uh, uh, young man who was not in respiratory distress, had no stridor, and he had no palpable leaf nodes in his neck, and his oral cavity and all fibers were essentially normal. His otoscopy was also normal. Of note, was on the flexible nasal endoscopy, he had a right anterior one third trifocal cord hyperemic mass, uh, which was also involved in the arterial cordial. However, the vocal cords were at normal mobility. So the plan uh, from our OPD was to uh, book the patient for a panendoscopy and uh, biopsy, and uh, also just do a workup uh, in terms of a chest X-ray to just rule out um, any um, um, uh, TB and also to do a COVID test, which came out negative. His chest X-ray was essentially normal. Um, and his panendoscopy fi findings uh, of significance was uh, uh, the right anterior one third vocal cord bulky polypoid mass, which with no vocal cord fixation, and also involving the uh, anterior commissure. Uh, the mass was a uh, hemorrhagic on biopsy. We had to use adrenaline patches to uh, uh, get hemostasis. It was bulky with a, um, um, a, a sort of a bow valve. Um, 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 uh, uh, appearance on um, um, uh, on the anterior commissure with compromise to the uh, uh, airway. Uh, uh, however, the left vocal cord was normal. So this was just a picture I could uh, try and take from um, uh, the, uh, uh, from theatre. You can see here this is how bulky the, uh, the the mass was, and you can see small patches there that were trying to arrest the hemorrhage. It was quite hemorrhagic could manage to take out all of it. So on histology, it came out um, uh, with, uh, with, uh, consistent of, with a vocal cord polyp uh, with uh, fragments co co containing fibroelastic proliferation, extensive hemorrhage, and features of chronic, chronic inf inflammation. Um, and um, his tissue for microbiology was uh, negative for us uh, first personally. 
Um, so the follow-up plan uh, is, is, is uh, still awaiting definitive surgery. In this uh, case, he's going to have laser surgery, but he, uh, he's currently uh, on uh, omeprazole and he was cancelled regarding uh, lifestyle change uh, on smoking and alcohol. And um, post uh, surgery, the plan is to also uh, consider for his rehabilitation. So, just a, a, a discussion about uh, the nine vocal lesions. Um, they account for uh, between eleven and between eleven and um, between eleven and uh, twenty-two uh, percent of patients presenting with voice disorders, and they are non-malignant growth of abnormal tissue on the vocal cords and they cause dysphonia and hoarseness of voice is the main clinical presentation. So regarding classification, they classify it as non-neoplastic or neoplastic, uh, with non-neoplastic um, being sub, uh, divided into sonic and uh, cystic uh, 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 benign uh, vocal cord lesions. So the non-neoplastic, um, the solid ones, uh, this encompasses the vocal cord polyps, vocal nodules, uh, rankings, edema, intubation granulomas, leukoplakia or keratosis, and amyloid tumors. And um, also to add on that, uh, other infective causes like uh, uh, TB and uh, other granulomatous uh, conditions like sarcoidosis. And then the cystic um, non-neoplastic lesions um, are the biotactal cyst, circular cyst, and laryngeal cyst. Um, and then the neoplastic ones, which I had um, uh, not drawn much into in, in this uh, presentation, covers the squamous papilloma, which are the subdivided into uh, juvenile onset and adult onset papillomas. And then neochondromas, hemangioma, granular cell tumor, and rapid myopathies. So regarding the benign lesions of the vocal cords, it is important to uh, disorient ourselves regarding the anatomy and histology of uh, uh, the vocal cord. Um, in particular, the lining of the vocal cord, which are divided into five uh, 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 layers. We, you have your squamous epithelium, and then uh, the basement membrane. And then uh, you have this uh, uh, superficial lamina propria, which uh, uh, which also uh, is known as the record space, and then the intermediate lamina and the deep lamina uh, propria, which are all uh, covering the focalis muscle. Um, this is just a, a graph to show, to, to highlight the uh, uh, prevalence or the, uh, of uh, benign uh, 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 vocal cord lesions. You can see here that the vocal cord polyps are the ones that are more prevalent and they are between the ages of 20 and uh, 59, and then followed by vocal cord nodules, and then uh, followed by cysts in the older uh, group. And then just in comparison with the neoplastic, uh, benign neoplastic vocal cord uh, 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 lesions, that's uh, our usual papilloma, that are more common in children. And uh, then in adult onset, they are also comparably uh, um, uh, frequent, frequently seen. So I'll start off with a um, um, discussion on uh, vocal cord polyps. Uh, these are persistent, usually unilateral movement venous lesions with hemorrhagic, fibrotic, or transducing characteristics. So they can be found um, a, mainly on the inner aspect of the focal cord, uh, sometimes causing significant airway obstruction if they are quite huge and they can be as huge and um, uh, hemorrhagic, causing uh, obstruction of uh, your upper airway. Uh, this is a, a bit smaller than what the one in our case that we are currently managing. So the benign, uh, these are benign swellings, which are more than three millimeters that arise from the free edge of the focal cord. And most commonly, um, the most common uh, structural abnormalities that cause hoarseness, as you have uh, seen in the, in the graph. And they are more common in males with a ratio of three to one. And they are more common in smokers between the age of 30 and 50. And, um, they are mainly due to uh, uh, vocal abuse or phonotrauma, but um, uh, smoking and alcohol intake are significant um, uh, uh, risk factors, and as well as gastroesophageal reflux disease. And um, they are more common in, in males, as I had highlighted. 
Microscopically, um, they are, you, you, you can um, note that they have vascular basement membrane disruption with capillary proliferation and thrombosis and minute uh, hemorrhagic and fibrin excitation. Um, they are divided into uh, basically three subtypes that's the gelatinous, the hemorrhagic, or telangiectic, and uh, mixed and tra transitional. Um, so the gelatinous uh, 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 subtype uh, shows uh, gelatinous stroma with fibrosis. And then the hemorrhagic or telangiectatic uh, ones they have dilated blood vessels and uh, um, hemorrhagic polyp. And um, in our case, we, uh, uh, we thought this was the uh, subtype of our uh, patient's uh, focal cord polyp. And then the mixed transitional, which uh, uh, has dilated blood vessels within gelatinous substance. Um, regarding management of focal cord polyps, um, divided into medical and surgical. Uh, basically, medical uh, for a, a big uh, focal cord polyps is unlikely to cause resolution. Uh, however, if the patient is on any medication, in particular anticoagulant therapy, it is advised that they have to stop. Uh, and cardiac ther therapy, and uh, we start off the patient on uh, PPIs uh, as reflux can cause hyperemia and capillary dilatation. And also, a short course of voice therapy is also advised for uh, small, smaller vo vocal cord polyps. Then, surgical management uh, you, you, most polyps require surgical management, in particular, excision with micro surgical instruments. And um, uh, laser has become the mainstay uh, in modern uh, focal cord benign uh, And uh, voice response surgery is highly uh, advised. So this patient will need to be followed up in the voice clinic and um, uh, uh, make sure that they have uh, voice rest. Then I move on to the rankus edema. This is an accumulation of uh, uh, fluid in the superficial layer of the lamina propria. Uh, Taking back to the diagram of the vocal cord uh, uh, histology uh, or uh, micro anatomy. Um, and the fluid is usually along the entire length of the fold, and uh, it's greater in the su superior surface of the fold and also accumulates along the medial uh, surface. So you can see here, this is one of the severe forms of uh, uh, edema with a lot of fluid uh, uh, causing. Enlargement of uh, the focal cords. And then early on, the fluid is watery and relatively clear, and later in the disease, the fluid is very thick. Histologically, in both cases, the lamina propria is edematous with small pools of liquid fluid between areas of elastic fibers. And chronically, uh, this is a chronically a reversible, uh, reversible uh, swelling of uh, um, uh, the, the focal cords, and the case mainly in middle aged women. And uh, they are usually bilateral. And the edema is usually bilateral, but in, it, it is often asymmetrical in some cases. But compared to normal fault, um, uh, the uh, superficial lamina propria in Rankin's uh, edema is increased mass and decreased stiffness. And in general, fundamental frequency is proportional to stiffness and it was proportional to mass. So these patients uh, will present with a low pitch, and if it's a woman, um, they usually get frustrated with a, a very hoarse and low pitched voice. But you can actually uh, probably think that they are a, a, a man if they are on the phone. Um, so clinically, clinical presentation, uh, like I said, is a deepening of uh, the pitch of the voice and gruffiness of the voice, effortful uh, speaking, and in some cases, choking episodes. And the okay, uh, almost exclusively in moderate to heavy smokers and uh, those with uh, voice strain and extra, uh, extra esophageal reflux may also uh, uh, develop rectus edema. The hypothyroidism has also been uh, associated with uh, rectus edema, and uh, in the management, you uh, notice that you need to also rule out hypothyroidism, and if it's there, you treat it accordingly. Um, this is um, uh, one of the gradients that I have come across uh, that in Rankes edema is graded grade one to grade four, with grade one uh, being marginal edema, uh, marginal edge edema, that's the mild form, and then 
grade two being obvious sessile swelling thrown over for caries, muscle to inflammation. And then grade three is a large bed like swelling filled with, with fluid. And then uh, grade four, uh, partially obstructed lesions uh, in the medial borders, contact along mm -hmm. most uh, of the length of the focal cord. Um, like I said, um, uh, smoking is uh, one of the uh, uh, biggest etiological factor, but um, it is also associated with uh, uh, reflux disease and uh, voice abuse. And um, management uh, decisions uh, to treat uh, depends on the severity of symptoms and um, uh, severity of edema and uh, in some way, presence of leukoplakia, which can be a reason for um, um, uh, further follow up <coughs> with uh, malignant transformation. And voice therapy is helpful if the edema is mild um, and surgery is necessary for most or more, uh, more significant edema. So in either cases, the edema will recur if the patient continues to smoke. Uh, it's very important to cut the patient regarding change in lifestyle regarding smoking. Um, surgical management of rankous edema uh, indications for surgery, even if the patient continues to smoke, include the following. If there's any concern in, uh, of a neoplastic lesion, that is when they, uh, on, on, on macroscopic uh, view, there is leukoplakia. You need to consider that's a, a, an absolute indication for uh, surgery. And if there is any uh, airway obstruction, it's in the case of our, um, uh, our patient, um, uh, though it was a, a, a vocal cord polyp, uh, but the, it was quite bulky, but he, he, needed, he definitely needs surgery. You can't uh, do much weight. And in most cases, conservative measures such as reassure, uh, reassurance, vocal hygiene, smoking cessation, treatment of upper respiratory tract infections, and treatment of hypothyroidism and allergies, uh, this, is, this will help as, as adjuncts to uh, surgery as well. This is just a diagram to highlight um, um, the surgical um, uh, management of uh, rankous edema. So you need to, uh, to put in uh, incision on the vocal cord uh, laterally and uh, use a suction to suction off the, uh, the fluid and because of flaps uh, uh, are raised in the thick fluid suction and it is important to also trim uh, the redundant uh, tissue uh, so that you can uh, restore uh, voice. Um. So rehabilitation and follow-up. If the patient does not quit smoking, voice therapy can be useful, uh, but it is uh, highly uh, recommended that we cancel all the patients with rankous edema and guided cessation of uh, smoking. Um, then I'll move on to vocal cord nodules. Uh, these are bilateral thickening characterized by epithelial or hypothesia, uh, basement membrane thickening, fibrosis, and lamina propria edema. Um, the term nodules should be used for lesions that have proven uh, chronicity. That is, uh, I, I think that in other uh, literature, they use more than three months as uh, 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 chronicity, and the patient will have been seen with the visualization of the focal uh, uh, nodules. And one of the etiological features that is absolutely common in this vocal cord nodules is vocal abuse. And it's, uh, more common in singers or those uh, people who uh, use their voice excessively during work, like teachers. Um, and it's more common in young, uh, uh, the young uh, people and high incidence in female individuals. Um, the pathophysiology of uh, vocal cord nodules uh, involves trauma, uh, which causes hemorrhage in the submucosal space. Uh, followed by hyaluronization and fibrosis and um, underlying epithelium undergoes hyperplasia, the, uh, resulting in the formation of the nodule. So these are some of the common um, um, uh, popular uh, uh, celebrities that have uh, developed uh, uh, vocal cord nodules and uh, in common uh, is they are all singers. So this is quite a common um, uh, condition that, is, that can be carrier uh, threatening to these people and we need to uh, follow them up and make sure uh, get them into uh, voice uh, rehab 
and uh, regular uh, follow up in voice clinics. So medical management, uh, speech therapy should be utilized as the first line uh, treatment and these may resolve spontaneously, uh, but you should also consider treating the aggravating factors like voice abuse, um, allergies, gastrointestinal reflux disease. And um, on the follow up, uh, this patient can be uh, very frustrated. It is very important that you can do a photo documentation on each visit, you can actually um, uh, do serial uh, uh, photographs of uh, the vocal cord and show them uh, on any improvement so that you can uh, uh, prompt them to uh, continue with uh, um, um, uh, speech therapy. And um, surgery uh, for larger and long standing uh, nodules is indicated. And this involves excision of the nodules using microsurgical instruments. And um, in uh, modern surgery, laser vaporization of, uh, of nodules using pulsed carbon dioxide laser is suitable and has been widely used in centers with uh, access to laser. Then the, the um, uh, third um, voc benign uh, vocal cord lesion I'm going to talk about is the vocal cord cyst. Um, it's a three dimensional uh, spherical or oval ovoid non-cancerous structure buried below the surface of one or really both vocal cord. So here you can see um, a cyst forming within the vocal cord. And uh, they're divided into mucus retention and epidermoid uh, cysts. And uh, mucus retention uh, arises from blow, uh, the uh, theories are around mucus retention uh, is they arise from a blocked minus thyroid gland, usually unilateral and is found on the free edge of the vocal fold. Um, and it's due to uh, mainly uh, 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 voice uh, abuse and in some instances, inflammation from um, uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease and uh, uh, upper uh, respiratory tract infections. And then the other subtype is ep epidermoid cysts. Uh, these are filled with keratin and cholesterol debris, and they're thought to arise from healing of mucosa injured by voice abuse or uh, buried epithelial cells. And um, both cause voice to con constantly, constantly uh, become hoarse, which may worsen and reduce. And management goals uh, is try trial voice therapy, uh, but men will eventually require surgery. And we also need to consider post-operative voice therapy. However, with vocal cord um, uh, uh, cysts, um, there are problems with glottal closure uh, post-surgery. And um, these patients might need medialization with uh, fat or uh, collagen. Uh, then the other uh, 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 benign lesion that I'm going to talk about is the intubation granular mass. And um, these are uh, mainly uh, uh, due to endolaryngeal surgery affecting the arrhythmic perichondrium. And it can also result from acute or chronic intubation and in procedures like rigid bronchoscopy and other direct laryngeal uh, manipulation. Uh, so they're usually uh, quite huge, uh, but um, uh, quite uh, easy to manage uh, as surgery is usually the mainstay when they are uh, quite enlarged. So the, the result from direct abrasion of the arrhythmic perichondrium and uh, also uh, result from a break in the mucosa as a result of coughing on an endotracheal tube for those patients who are in ICU and are pro, uh, ventilated and intubated chronically. So long-term pressure across the vocal cord area uh, process um, uh, is also part of the uh, pathophysiology and is usually attached to directly to the vocal process and they are usually bilateral. Uh, but in some instances, they can be unilateral. Um, uh, they present with uh, a partial or complete fixation of one of both arachnoid cartilages in severe cases. And we can also note that interarachnoid uh, synechia may be present. Uh, management, um, if the injury is recent, um, antibiotic coverage for several weeks is uh, uh, helpful, but uh, speech therapy post extubation and surgery. Um, is uh, recommended. In some, in, in some centers, they use uh, corticosteroid injection into the base of the granuloma before removal. And there's been um, um, uh, uh, studies on mitomycin C 
that has uh, proven to be um, a very uh, helpful in uh, management of uh, um, education and development. So, in summary, uh, uh, vocal cord, uh, the nine uh, vocal cord lesions um, uh, evaluation and management encompasses a good history and examination and um, to obtain a, a tissue diagnosis through uh, biopsy and histology and rule out other uh, uh, um, uh, conditions like malignants and infections like TB. And then medical therapy is important and encompasses use of uh, uh, proton pump inhibitors to uh, treat uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease and um, treatment of allergies and uh, regular treatment of upper respiratory tract infections. And then these patients will need to be uh, uh, followed up in the uh, voice clinic uh, for voice therapy. And it is important to uh, um, cancel the patient regarding lifestyle modification and surgery for um, uh, larger uh, vocal cord lesion, benign vocal cord lesion is uh, uh, important, particular laser therapy. And then these patients need to be followed up and man their management is basically multidisciplinary with surgeons and um, uh, voice therapists and speech therapists uh, and other clinicians that are involved in uh, infection treatment. In summary, so benign vocal cord lesions are of uh, clinical interest um, and importance, and they interfere with the normal voice and outward speech. As you can see, uh, you highlight, you highlight the, the vocal cord nodules. They can be career uh, threatening, and rarely this may cause obstruction in rest, uh, of the respiratory tract, uh, as in um, uh, upper airways obstruction uh, uh, complicating uh, patients. And then it is mandatory to distinguish them from malignant laryngeal uh, lesions, and it is important to get a tissue uh, diagnosis on them. Um, and we have to rule out um, malignants unless the lesion resolves with treatment uh, or is reported benign on histological examination. I think that's my last slide. These are part of my references. Thank you. So I uh, will call upon any comments and um, uh, uh, questions. Um, hello, thank you for a very nice talk. So the interesting thing is we haven't seen many polyps in COVID. And it's either because they were afraid of COVID or there were probably not sports events going on. So men get it. And the thing is the sporting event that they shout a lot, so that's why they get polyps. And it's always a very specific subtype of man, it's the marketers or the talkers or the coaches, they tend to shout a lot. I think what is very important with the vocal cord nodules. So you did say speech therapy, but sometimes you just need to think about it logically. So sometimes it's the teachers or the um, people often in the call centers get it. And then you just got to think, can they hear properly? Do they have to shout? Or sometimes, a professional voice coach, like a singing coach, can help them a lot because if they keep on shouting, they never gonna they're gonna keep on coming back with nodules. So what singing coaches do is they literally teach them how to use their diaphragm, how to get more volume out so that they don't slam the vocal cords together. I think what is very important is if you're going to work with the speech therapies, if you can get somebody that's gonna be eating voice, because it's it's an art on its own. It's, it's literally, they look at how long they can talk, they listen to the pitch, they can hear exactly what, which muscles is going to spasm. So it's very important that if you send them for speech therapy, if there is a speech therapist that loves voices, it makes a huge difference because they just think about it differently. It's not just going for speech therapy, it's an art for them and they can get much better results. I think the problem with blindness is always should you operate them if they smoke? I do because most of them are not going to smoke. So I would operate them even if they do smoke. I tell them to stop smoking, but a lot of them don't. So I would probably still operate them smoking. And I think what's very important is if you can get a very simple grading system so that when you see them in the clinic, you grade them whether you, you know, whatever system you use, so that when you follow up, you can grade them again. And if you don't just go on what the patient says to you, you can literally grade them to see how long they can keep the um, certain letters for, 
so that you can actually see objectively whether they got it. Um, you, you mentioned that you're going to use use laser to move that, um, that, that point. Um, but why do you want to use laser? Initially, would you use laser for that? For the pod? Yeah. So it's, it's a, a, a lot of things. You can do, like, you can use gold steel. So a lot of communities have held lasers now, just because it's a fine tip and precision you can do and it's for evaluation at the same time. So you don't have to, but a lot of them now use the handheld laser, contact laser for a fine tip, and it's just very really elegant to take it off. You don't have to do it. But I, I think, sorry, pollen will not go away with speech therapy. They need to be cut out, and nodules will come back. If you don't help them, whether to get a, a, micro, a, a microphone or a sound system, so the small polyps, like the small nodules, need speech therapy. The bigger one often comes to us, but you have to get the, with all of them, you have to involve speech therapy or a voice coach. Otherwise, they will come back if they don't learn to speak the right way. And I heard a, 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 a panel some years ago, and the data expert, and then the school student expert, was talking about voice outcomes for the kind of disease. And I think the consensus really was that it really depends on which hands and the data of the school student is. They you know, uh, 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 really still search his hands. Yes. Uh, but certainly you can do it on the farm as well. So that you must be really careful. I think the other thing is also with the cysts diagnosing. They are very tricky to get out of the fall. And if you don't call it a cyst, they always recur. And then you can tell the patient that there's a good chance that they might recur. And often it gets diagnosed as a polyphage or a garden. If you see a unilateral one, make sure it's not a cyst because you've got to excise them in a different way. You quoted a few figures in terms of honor, you've got lots of work on the voice and he's run, run courses. Um, and um, he, he did some study with the intern and the intra observer error. In terms of, of making diagnoses of vocal cord pathology, it's actually quite high. And so, um, and so it can be difficult to make the right, right diagnosis in practice. It's often intra op mm. that you, you know, when you put the microscope there and they are not moving, that you can actually see, aha, uh -huh, this is actually a system on the module. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, I see there's a question. Uh, Good morning. There are indications that chronic irritation can be a contributing factor to oral cancer development. Have you found out anything about this in the literature? Um, personally, I, I haven't uh, found anything about this. I don't know. I think the buzzword with larynx nowadays is that there's a hypersensitive laser the larynx. And we see a lot of COVID patients. And it's a, it's a, um, that they would suddenly gag on fine grain food or something that they would literally eat like strawberries and they would start coughing. And it's, it's as if after COVID, the larynx got hypersensitive. So small things would give them these coughing bouts and things like that. Um, so it seems like to be the new first word in larynx, and it's like you need to treat the reflux and the voice therapy, but they also need like um, amitriptyline or lyrica or things like that just to desensitize them, and speech therapy as well to desensitize them. If you want to say something about the personal management of the vocal <laughs> It depends who you ask. So I don't do voice rest, I do limited voice use. So I will tell them no long phone calls will tell your mother what the operation was like, but you can do the basics, you know, just not long conversations, but you can say the minimum. It depends on who you are. Some people do complete voice use. I think it's impossible. So I would just say limited voice use for three days. For three days? Yeah. Okay, and then PPI, do you need to start? 
in the print. I think it was so in fashion and I really, so I think you've got to look at the patient. Sometimes you see this young patient and it's really, he's got a module, but he talks a lot and there's no sign of weakness. I'm not going to put him on. It, you know, you're going to see posterior size, but I don't routinely put them on it. If there's no signs and you can get the marketer and while he, you're having a consult, he never stops talking, I'm not going to put him on reflux gene, but there's a reason why he's got the module. It's not necessary to be reflux. So the, the, the question is, does it make you more prone to have reflux? I think you've got to put it on, take it on an individual basis. I don't think you've got it. What are you doing, Turkey? So we are putting there in the morning 10 days complete horse rest after the surgery. <laughs> 10 days, yes. And also everyone's getting yeah, the light. So uh, we, we don't tell of it to be honest. We give everyone the light with that. Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, my practice, I was a little bit more selective, so I often find out about the social history about nicotine use, uh, caffeine use, but find even though they have clinically experienced reflux, but if they have the risk factors with central obesity, then I will put them on a PPI, like not 15, but like it's a young teacher, a young smoker, so it's not a PPI. Yeah, yeah. 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 Hello. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, okay. I can. Hi, this is Bear. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to. Uh, I just thought it's important to highlight this entity of muscle tension dysphonia that uh, you know the uh, patients with these benign vocal cord lesions um, often suffer from as well uh, because uh, you know often if the the important thing to consider is the the, the occupation of the patient. And um, if the, for example, we see a, in private practice, we see a lot of patients coming from the call centers. So when these patients have some type of uh, benign vocal cord lesion, then they have a, uh, um, they develop a chronic sort of laryngitis, not, uh, we won't, can't say it's laryngitis, but a, uh, a chronic dysphonia. Uh, and uh, in the literature, they speak about this entity called muscle tension dysphonia, where there is an incoordination of the of the uh, intra or and extra laryngeal muscles, and uh, this is something worth mentioning also. Um, and and if you have a patient that, uh, yeah, but this this does not require any surgical intervention. It uh, it's usually dealt with by the. Sorry, uh, can you hear me? Is it, but am I clear? Can you hear me? You are clear. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so this, this entity of muscle tension dysphonia is something to also keep in mind when you're seeing a patient with a chronic um, uh, dysphonia that uh, they pro they're probably abusing their voice or they are excessively trying to get a voice out when they don't have a voice. And they use the the incorrect muscles uh, to produce that voice, like uh, something like a falsetto. So what happens is that they get so used to using the incorrect muscles that call and that usually causes uh, pain in the in the neck after speaking for long periods of time. And uh, I think it's something important to keep in mind uh, when you have a patient with a chronic. Uh, so it's important to uh, uh, exclude some type of benign lesion, uh, which can be uh, managed, and then also highlight to the uh, to the speech therapist that you know you think that this patient has got uh, this muscle tension dysphonia and should be very uh, give them very uh, careful 
voice hygiene uh, tips. Thanks. Yes, so so I, I fully agree. So it's kind of like when you've got a, a sore shoulder, then you start, you know, let's say you're a tennis player, you suddenly got to change your backhand to the other one, and then you develop wrong ways of doing something. So I often refer them to osteopaths or young chiropractors because they can get into the muscles of the larynx. But if you have a good speech therapist, they do um, learn how to do a laryngeal massage. Some of them, or if you go to a professional voice coach, you know, uh, there's one lady here, Amanda Wait. She was a very prominent of the car singer in the 80s, but she actually she is a voice coach and she went to Germany and how to, and to learn how to um, manipulate the larynx. And she can tell you exactly which muscles go into spasm and she can release it. So that's why I, we, I fully agree. And you can actually diagnose them when you just help take all the external clavomastic muscles or the neck muscles. You, or you can literally see when they walk in that their shoulders are higher than they should be. So um, that's why I said you must get a speech therapist that's got an interest in them because they can often pick this up and they self can manipulate it or they can send it to somebody. But no, I think I need shares in the, the osteopath society because we do often use them for a young chiropractor. They are better than physios for specific the, the, the narratives. Thanks, yeah. thanks. And one other comment is this uh, uh, laryngeal uh, electromyography. Uh, do you, are you guys aware of anybody uh, in Cape Town doing that? Uh, you know, to test the um, neurological function of the of the recurrent laryngeal nerve for no. paresis. We don't test them. We've had a few patients that had. We now have three in the past year that had a thyroidectomy and the superior laryngeal nerve was cut. So they right. came in and suddenly they dropped the whole octave. Um, so I know there's surgery that we can do um, for that. But then uh, we did a test there. It was a clinical diagnosis. And the only thing we could do for them was send them to speech therapists. And they did you teach them how to be a bit more animated when they talk. But we don't routinely test the nerve of the of the larynx. We don't have that with them. We, um, unless we've never tried, and that's why we don't use it. Okay. Thank. Thank you. I don't see any other uh, questions to raise the hands. Uh, Good morning, everyone. Hello, can you hear me? You can go ahead. Okay. First of all, I'd love to congratulate the organizers and you, the presenter, for the excellent, precise, and targeted presentation. And uh, next, uh, my question is uh, on vocal poly polyps. As you can see, as we as as we all know, the when you see the pathogenesis or the chronology of the vocal cord polyps, the first one is the hemorrhagic polyp, and then there will be they will undergo to the fibrous uh, degeneration. So are you guys are going to recommend any kind of patient who is coming there uh, with a hemorrhagic type of polyp with a, to proceed with the surgery or are you going to always do the conservative management because the practice here in Turkey is different because usually in those kind of patients, if we're having the early stage or the hemorrhagic type of polyp, we're going to see them with a conservative treatment and most of them will improve due to that. So if uh, the patient comes to you with this similar problem, are you going to pursue, uh, are you going to have this uh, apple hand I mean, uh, option for, for fibrous polyp and the uh, hemorrhagic polyps? So our referral pattern unfortunately works like that. We never see them acutely. So we never see them like the Monday after the rough brigade. Um, so you must understand it goes to a tertiary institution. Unfortunately, our referral pattern works like that, that they normally get to us like six months later. So the acute ones, we would actually just observe, they are with the complete, complete voice rest. Um, I might even consider steroids, but complete voice rest for the acute ones. We unfortunately just never see those. Um, we just see them six months later, and by that time, we know that it's not going to be better. And that's why for the, for the follow, we would probably continue with surgery, 
but I fully agree. So the hemorrhagic quality, you know, the ones after the sports event, those ones we will just observe. Thank you. I wanted to comment on the test on the quality, just one little bit better. Yeah. So when we did it with the judgment of the other day, it was very like it was in the anterior commission. Mm -hmm. And it was the five first time but with the wide base. So and it was bleeding a lot. Even when I did it first time, it was bleeding quite a lot. So I felt that if we go with cold steel and try to excise all of it, it, it was technically not possible because of the position and also because of the bleeding. So that's why she felt that maybe. Should be better if it's done on the basis. Yeah. Okay. Um, that picture looked a bit odd though. It didn't look like a classic design. You know, it, it looked like like more like a masculine vision, like a new menu or something. It didn't look like a typical benign product that would come by the oyster. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have a I think this brings us to the end of the uh, uh, meeting. We'll see you again next week on Friday. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.